Great. Welcome to Making at Home, Ensuring Equity, presented as a collaboration with HP, Digital Promise, Intel, and Microsoft. I'm your host, Megan Pattenhouse. I'm a designer for learning designer for Reinvent the Classroom. I'm joined by my colleague, Stanley Berry, who will be moderating the Q&A back channel during this webinar, as well as our special guest, Nick Shiner, Director of Maker Learning. At Digital Promise, our mission is to accelerate innovation in education to improve opportunities for all learners. This means closing the digital learning gap, not only in access, but also in participation and powerful use. Digital Promise invests at the intersection of these stakeholder groups, educators, researchers, and developers, because we know that to reach tech's full potential, we need to focus on amplifying human capacity. Educators must have every possible tool and resource to engage motivate and personalize learning with and for their students. Developers must be informed by education research and be supported by connections with practitioners to design products that solve salient challenges and improve student outcomes. Researchers must evolve new methodologies that produce results in a way that matches the speed of technology. To accomplish these goals, we believe in the power of networks, the sharing of stories from the field, support and investment in research, and an engagement in lifelong learning. Our networks bring together education stakeholders in critical conversations about pedagogy and educational equity. One of those networks is our Reinvent the Classroom program. In collaboration with HP, Microsoft, and Intel, Digital Promise brings together educators from across the US and Canada in our HP Learning Studios, HP Spotlight Schools, and HP Teaching Fellows. The schools and educators in this network exemplify Digital Promise's principles of powerful learning. These principles are built upon decades of learning sciences research and guide educators in designing learning experiences that engage the hearts and minds of learners. Learning experiences that provide opportunities for students to deeply engage in their learning while using technology in ways that contribute to closing the digital learning gap. Powerful learning means learning that is personal and accessible authentic and challenging, collaborative and connected, and inquisitive and reflected. These principles do not work in isolation, but are synergistic and mutually supportive. In today's webinar, you'll hear how two HP teaching fellows and educators at our HP Spotlight School use maker learning for powerful learning at home. I'd like to introduce you to our HP teaching fellows, Zelia Capitao Tavarich, a hybrid teacher and digital lead learner in, Ontario, uh, in Toronto, Ontario and Dean Benjamin, math and science teacher from Regina, Saskatchewan. Also joining us from our HP Spotlight School in Nampa, Idaho, we have Greg Heideman, principal, Maddie Dew, math teacher, and Drew Williams, instructional coach. Before we get started, Zelia and Dean are gonna share a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that where I'm sharing from this evening, um, we are hosting on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. I also like to recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Born to immigrant parents as a first-generation Canadian, I am privileged and honored and humbled to live on and learn from, as well as an educator, to give back uh, to this land and to its communities. I live in a different part of Canada, and uh, we have a little bit of a different acknowledgement. It's, uh, I wish to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Nehewa, the Nakaway, Nakoda, and homeland of the Métis, Lakota, and Dakota. Very nice. As we discuss how we can create equitable learning experiences at home, make sure to use that Q&A feature of Zoom to let us know your thoughts and questions throughout the webinar. This will be interactive and we would love to hear from you um, and collaborate with you. This webinar will be recorded for your future reference. And with that, I'll hand things over to Nick to get our conversation started. Hello and welcome everybody. Really exciting to be here tonight with all of these HP teaching fellows and the staff from Lone Star Middle School. Uh, before we get started and they will all have the opportunity to reintroduce themselves during our first question and provide a little bit more context about their role. I wanted to spend just a moment talking about how we define maker learning. Tonight, we'll be talking about maker learning and how we can create maker learning at home opportunities with a focus on equity for our learners. But in order to do that, we have to first understand what exactly maker learning is. Maker learning isn't just a subject or a space in a school. A lot of times it gets 
bumped in is just calling it a makerspace and the conversation ends there. We want folks to understand that it is broader than that. It is any hands-on design-centered way of engaging learners in powerful learning experiences that can enhance learning in both formal and informal learning environments. So I'm going to turn things over to our panelists in just a moment. I'm looking uh, right now, what we'll probably do is we'll go Zalia, then Dean, and then we can just go down the line for our Spotlight School folks as well. So my first question for each of you is, what has your COVID-19 education journey looked like? Uh, has it been fully virtual? Has it been hybrid in school? I'm sure for many of you that we're, you're, I'm going to actually hear a journey in just a moment. And those things have changed frequently. And how has it changed? So uh, we'll go ahead and start with Zelia, and you can again do a quick introduction of yourself as well. Hi everyone, I'm Zelia Capitan Tavares. This year, I'm in a hybrid teacher digital lead learner role uh, that was part-time but is now full-time role where I'm part of an amazing team of educators, some of whom are teaching HP teaching fellows themselves. And uh, our role is to provide support to educators and education workers in both remote settings and virtual school learning environments and ways in how to leverage district learning tools, focus on pedagogy and building global competence, as well as providing resources to guardians and families and students to access as well for this smooth transition. In doing all of this, we're really encouraging educators to reimagine how they're building community and student engagement online, as well as exploring instructional strategies that can be used to support a class community of learners within a virtual setting. Now, to be honest, our, we just announced uh, public health in Toronto. Uh, we're pivoting back to remote. So all schools in our district are now going back to remote. And so this transition is happening again and supports are being put in place and um, how to help teachers balance synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities, what that could look like, what kind of make our learning environment look like within those environments for students to excel. And how can we design lessons that take into consideration adjustments that need to make to be made to ensure that all students from K to 12 are contributing members to their learning. Thank you so much, Zalia. And I'm gonna turn things over to Dean. Hello, uh, yeah, I'm Dean Benderman. I teach uh, up here in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. We're just kind of north of North Dakota and Montana. Actually, my job change, uh, title changed a little bit. I'm the 21st century education leader at my school, but I teach math and uh, social studies. And uh, it's been a, a great journey. And yeah, throughout this last year, even, you know, like uh, at this time last year, we were in crisis learning, which basically meant that every kid passed no matter where they were at, where they had a 20, they got a 50 and they passed and there was supplemental learning. So that was quite a challenge uh, in itself to keep kids motivated and stuff. But I found maker learning uh, was a great way to engage with a lot of the students that I had and we had a really good experience and I can go into that more. Uh, we started the year off basically uh, in, a, in a quadrant se uh, setting, and then we kept kids in, uh, you know, they only had three classes a day instead of the five that we usually had, and we saw them every day, and it worked, it worked really well, but then we had to go to a hybrid model where we saw kids one day, and uh, the kids from A to K were one day, and L to Z were the next day, and they, you know, they had two-hour classes, and there was one class that was one hour that went over both uh, quadrants. And at Christmas time, we uh, went to remote learning. So just a week before Christmas and a week after uh, Christmas break, we were totally remote and uh, still had a great uh, experience with that too, uh, setting up students. And we were doing some project-based learning and using Makerspace in a really cool way that I can go into more. I'm a big fan and a big proponent of uh, Minecraft Education Edition. So uh, yeah, I find that to be a great way to make with uh, students. And then uh, we went back to hybrid and it's been working good, but lately, uh, just, just before Easter break that we're on right now, uh, the variant crept into, uh, our, uh, into our city. So we're on remote learning again, and uh, it's gonna be a little bit different this time because it's also gonna go through one of our, um, our finals uh, when we come back. So a lot of teachers are trying to wrap their head around that, but. Uh, I've really found that it's, you know, the main thing with this is just making sure the kids are their social uh, emotional learning needs are, are met. There's a lot going on, uh, you know, with everything people are experiencing uh, the pandemic in different ways. And it was always important to, to build relationships with students, but 
even more so. And I do find Makerspace allows that when you get kids engaged in their learning and you, you get you let them kind of take the wheel and you have conversations with them, um, you know, I just find that the, the students have really responded well to that. And I've got some of my best uh, projects in that because I think they've really excelled and really enjoyed uh, doing that. But it's been great uh, in a lot of ways. I hope there's some uh, silver linings that we take forward after all this. And I'm hoping that more teachers look at like makerspace slash, you know, project-based learning, because I think the kids are thinking uh, more rather than just mimicking or, you know, just getting ready for the test. And this has kind of brought the, the test into, you know, question like, oh, are they cheating or, or things like that? So um, yeah, it's definitely, a, a, you know, it's too bad what had to happen for it, but I think there's a lot of positives that are, are going to happen moving forward. Thank you so much, Dean. I'm excited to hear some of those reflections as we move through the questions that we have coming up this evening. Uh, so this is the tricky part because we've got three wonderful educators in different roles at Lone Star Middle. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Lone Star and one person can give kind of the, their background and the general overview. And then the other two can add their specific role context in, in the context of this question as well. So. It looks like Greg's already unmuted, so I'm going to let him go first. Oh, and I was going to say uh, I'll, I'll let my instructional coach uh, Drew Williams, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I'll go ahead and share just real fast. My name is Greg Heidemann. I'm the principal here at Lone Star Middle School. Um, uh, excited to be with uh, each of you here tonight to kind of share our story uh, as an HP Spotlight School. Um, for us, we started the year um, in in remote. We then in um, uh, end of or end of September, October-ish, uh, started the transition into hybrid. Um, right around Thanksgiving, then we moved back into full remote until the middle of uh, January, where we went from um, um, hybrid uh, to or went from remote into hybrid, and then we went from hybrid into full time after spring break. So we are officially six days with all kids um, that we haven't had for over a year. So we have made that transition um, a, as a school, and and it's been very interesting. I, and I echo what uh, uh, Dean is saying that there's a lot of things that that as a school and as a staff that we have learned uh, through this, you know, very difficult and uh, challenging and unique time. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I'm I'm excited for my staff and 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 just you know the staff of uh, of our district as a whole of how we've been able to to rise up to that challenge and, and i'm just excited about educators as a whole um because it is difficult times and because of that we we are able to still impact and and um make inroads into the lives of kids whether it's remote hybrid fully um the you know educators are the ones that are able to rise up to those challenges um drew um maddie anything that you'd like to add yeah, um, I'll add a few things and then I'll, I'll pass it over to Maddie because I know she'll have a lot to share as from her role as a teacher and having to go through all of the enormous changes with students this year. Um, I'm an instructional coach and so I've been fortunate to be able to work with teachers such as Maddie Dew um, in being a thinking partner or a guide through all of our different instructional um, modes this year, whether we were online or hybrid, or as of last week, we had um, first day of school number five, as we called it, and we welcomed all of our students back. Um, throughout the changes, that one thing that has remained steady has been our Wednesday schedules. Um, our Wednesday has been used as sort of a uh, virtual learning day where um, staff were still available to um, work with students but we didn't have um, students come in, whether it was hybrid or now back in person. Um, all of the learning was done um, either through an intervention or through um, online intervention, depending on what mode we were in. Um, as an instructional coach, I've also been able to um, use Wednesdays to work with teachers on planning or um, just, just managing all the different changes they were working through. It's also been time for our PLCs to meet and to collaborate, um, which has been really important this year as teachers have needed to brainstorm and, and lean on each other to work through these um, different modes. And um, it's also 
again, allowed for teachers to be able to, on a limited basis, bring students in so that they could work with, um, with a teacher in a one-on-one -on -one format or in a small group for some of that additional intervention or instruction. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how Wednesdays are utilized because that's been sort of a unique um, experience this year, but um, I'm going to stop there and pass it on to Maddie. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. I'm Maddie Dew, and I would echo a lot of what Drew and Greg had said. I guess from the teacher perspective, a big part of all of the changes has been just been trying to provide consistency for kids. Um, and I think maker learning has also kind of provided a space for kids to make sense of their learning and their home environment becoming one and the same um, and creating their own learning at home through whatever they're working on. Um, but other than that, I would agree with Drew and Greg. Thank you so much, Maddie, Drew, and Greg, as well as Dean and Zelia as well. Um, I just, before we move into the next question, like just the, the number of challenges and changes that you've all encountered over this last year, we, we know that education is one of the places where the biggest disruptions have been. So kudos to you. Thank you to each of you and the work that you do on behalf of your communities and the learners that you serve. So before we move into the next question, I really wanted to make sure that we honored that work that you've been doing. So now we move into the actual maker learning questions. So the first question that I have, and this is open forum. So if you've got something you want to share here, please feel free to do so. If not, you're more than welcome to pass on this question as well. But what I'm really curious about is how did maker learning factor into your instructional practice during the pandemic response. That's really difficult to do. It's hands-on learning. Uh, we know that there's issues of equity that we'll talk about a little bit in the future in one of these uh, future questions. But I'd really just love to hear just like a general overview of, of how this amazing learning experience and learning style factored in to your instructional practice during the pandemic. I guess I could uh, start things off. Great. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's for me, I'm lucky, like I said, uh, I really have, I, I find that Minecraft education is, it's a great tool uh, to use for, for makerspace. And uh, a couple of examples that I have, like in my math class, so I teach high school and in my math class, I got a, you know, these are like 17 year olds and uh, we're learning about things like slope and surface area and volume and trig and, and a few other things. And so what I get them to do is, is build and make their own uh, amusement park using these concepts inside of uh, Minecraft. And I find that uh, a lot of kids are just really engaged in that because, you know, the math concepts are in there, but, you know, they can make it as simple as they want, or they can go and, and build to, uh, you know, go to town. And a lot of them, uh, I'm still f figure, feel like I'm a little bit of a noob at it, although I am learning, but the kids teach me a lot. And I think that's really important as well. And even with uh, the remote learning or hybrid learning, um, you know, they've been able, uh, we're lucky at my school, we're like, a, we use Office 365, so we're a Microsoft school, and the kids get it free at home, uh, so they can actually work at home. And there's even possibilities, um, you know, to also, uh, you know, download it from home. And we've been giving students, we'll answer your question a little bit more, but we've been giving students laptops if they need one, I can explain my area of uh, a little situation a little bit more, but uh, oh, sorry, uh, Zilli, do you have a question or I see your hand up? Oh, I think sorry. I think she was just volunteering to go next. <laughs> to go next, okay, sure, no, that's, that's, that's good, that's all good. If you have a question, please, <laughs> anybody fire away, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, so that's been uh, really positive to get the students making in that. Uh, I was teaching Social 9 and even through remote, uh, we learned about ancient civilizations and they were all making their own uh, doing their own research and making their own civilization so they would do the research and they would make the pyramids or you know they would make a, a step pyramid or a teepee uh you know all these different things and just seeing how they you know were you know some kids worked in groups and they were able to collaborate and make together and they could even you know play over line um, some kids uh, worked on their own and uh, really in, in enjoyed that so uh, you know, even some kids that maybe if they didn't have education edition, a lot of kids had like it on their Xbox, you know, and, uh, you know, the thing is, I, I, I was flexible enough to, to say, oh, let's try that. Maybe you can just video your screen or take screenshots or, or whatever. 
And that, you know, we always try to give a choice. Like if there's some kids that are really struggling through it, they could make blueprints and stuff of, of things or make a diorama, you know? So it, it basically every kid chose to make things in, in Minecraft, but uh, you know, there were, you know, I'm always open to new ideas and different ways. The key thing is that, you know, they were thinking, they were struggling, they were unstruggling, you know, they were helping each other out, they were doing research, they were building. Uh, and I think that was a really great thing to do, obviously, when we're face to face and in, in a normal quote unquote mode, but uh, especially in remote, like these students were able, I, I got some of my best projects uh, from a lot of students because I think they just had the time and the space to just to kind of unleash what they were capable of. And I saw some amazing work from, from students. So that's one example uh, that I thought I'd share about uh, maker learning and the great experience that I had with it. Thank you so much, Dean. Couple couple notes for you. One, if you're calling yourself a noob, you're not enough of a noob that you didn't know what noob meant. For those of you in the audience, noob means that you're new, new to the game, a newbie. Um, and I also love the 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 references to Minecraft Education Edition. Regular Minecraft is one of my favorite games to play. Uh, and I also love that you you talked a lot about the the opportunity for them to use other modalities as well that were analog. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to turn things over. I have two younger uh, yeah. kids. Go ahead. Uh, my, my kids call me a noob. So that's why I knew what it meant. So. Yep. You know what? We learn, we learn. <laughs> from our, I believe the children are our future. We, exactly. we learn from them. Yeah. Uh, Zelia, go ahead. Well, like kudos, Minecraft, absolutely all the way. Um, and before I even dug into Minecraft in this time last year, when we were pivoting to remote and launching into the new school year and supporting educators, the first thing that I needed to address was my own bias and assumptions on what materials and resources or equipment students had available to them at home. And in doing so, I realized that I needed to put together kits uh, that students needed, and those were either delivered to their homes or we arranged a pickup time at their home school. And then secondly, I needed to think about, and very carefully in doing so, considerations uh, and adjustments to lessons and activities that would engage all my students or the educators that I was working with to ensure uh, that they had access to materials and equipment and the technology, but also access to different spaces within their homes. Because our homes are private and it's not up for viewing by everyone. And whether it's intentional or unintentional, we need to be aware that our home is still a very private personal space. And so in leveraging tools like this one that we're using right now, video conferencing tools really allow to help close some of those gaps to feel that connection, but also addressing, um, you know, supports around accessibility and using captioning preferences or the breakout rooms for the students just to connect with their peers, to build on those relationships and to engage in those discussions. And knowing that they could always reach out to the teacher because the teacher was always in the main room or popping in and out of these breakout rooms. But one thing that the students said to me you know, hey, Ms. T, you know, I'm really missing out on teams and clubs. And so I was fortunate to come across Girls Who Game and saw this as an opportunity to engage our grades four to six girls in coding, STEM, computer science, all in Minecraft. So along with our teachers at our at McMurk Junior Public School, um, we worked with our students, our girls, to develop Minecraft building and coding skills and building on the global competencies and focusing on those transferable skills and also building an understanding on the global goals and how our daily actions and choices impact local and global communities. And so really what came out of that Girls Who Game experience is that our members uh, built this respect for each other and it was strengthened on their understanding and appreciation for patients. There was, that was tested time and time again. Um, their understanding and appreciation for being adaptable and learning new ways to connect with their learning with um, students and mentors and educators across North America. Minecraft allowed that to happen and Fr Flipgrid gave them that opportunity to amplify their voice and to share those ideas and build on those relationships as well. Go ahead, Maddie. Thank you, Zelia. Mm -hmm. um, I would largely add to both of those. I've less used Minecraft and in a lot of ways, I would say maker learning has been a little less intentional while I was online. It's been more, we were talking about something like slope and students weren't grasping it. So I had them go around to their house or wherever they were. Where can you find a positive slope? Where can you find a negative slope? Where do you see these concepts where you are? Um, since we don't necessarily have the manipulatives and materials we would normally use in the classroom. Um, or I know Dean had mentioned things like surface area. What can we actually find the area of in your house? How can we work with 
what you have and see this as kind of a strength um, and use this as part of our classroom since that's where you are, um, instead of just focusing on the differences of being at home versus being in school. But I also see a lot of the things that Celia had talked about, about students not necessarily having the resources they needed um, and just having to be adaptable both as a teacher and them having to be adaptable as students. Excellent. Thank you so much. I love that. Like find like finding ways to use what's around you, both like if they're actual materials that you're going to construct with, but also looking at things that have already been constructed, right? The home has been constructed. What went into that? Surface area, slope, all of these things are absolutely applicable in the design of any home. Uh, and is something that our learners can take a look at and really understand exactly how particular decisions were made about the design of their home, which is really cool too. Thank you so much. Dean, go ahead. And then we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, there's another story I'd share too. Like this time last year when we actually had crisis learning and it was optional kind of for students and, and that. So the, the kids, a lot of kids just kind of, you know, pieced out for lack of a better term, they took their mark. And uh, so as an educator, you really had to be creative to kind of get kids engaged. You, you kind of asked your, yourself, would kids still come to their your class if they didn't have to, right? And that's what I found, you know, uh, I found a lot of projects that were out there and there was one uh, uh, project, there was lots actually that we did, but there was one in particular that really stood out. Uh, we made, it was, there was a contest actually in Italy and it was about the UN sustainability goals. And we built a pandemic hospital and there was like me and like four or five other students we'd meet every day and we were going on there and we were building and talking and it was such a powerful learning experience. And these kids could have just not have came and taken their mark and all that kind of stuff. But the learning that went through and the collaboration and the talking and that uh, was amazing. So. Uh, I just thought I'd share that because it was such, it was, it was such a, a powerful learning experience as well. Thank you so much. And I'm, go ahead, go ahead, Drew. Is this for, is this by any chance in response to the question I'm seeing in the chat? I was just going to mention a few of the routines that as a coach I was able to help teachers with that I think we were able to help maximize our time with students to do some of these maker learning projects. And I'll be very brief because I know we're going to move on. Oh, that's okay. Um, but there were a few routines and, and these kind of work for no matter what subject area you teach. Um, but I wanna just mention first and foremost, our hybrid model, we used flipped instruction and that was huge to allow us to maximize that synchronous time with kids. So we had a lot of teachers who were videoing or finding video content or any content that they could give to students and trying to help build that student agency so that students would consume some of that independently, um, maybe with some guided notes or some questions to help them build the capacity to do that well, and then be able to come into class ready to be active in their learning and to start making. Um, we asked teachers to really consider how that synchronous time, whether we were online or in person, could be used for kids to work with materials and teachers could be conferencing, giving lots of feedback, um, lots of guidance, those things that they could do when they were when they were with those students in the moment. So I just wanted to add that on there. And, and OneNote and Microsoft Teams were really helpful places for us to have that content, as well as to have some of those collaborative channels for kids and teachers to work and talk. Thank you. No, that's, that's excellent. And before we move on to the next one, and Drew, this might be for you or, or Greg, or really anybody, but I'm thinking particularly from like an administrative and an instructional coach perspective, Tina asked in the chat, how did you inspire teachers school-wide to do this? And, and we know that I, you, Nobody's on the hook here for saying that they got 100% participation from the educators in their building, but, but was there anything in particular that you were able to do, particularly thinking about this through a virtual environment that you were able to encourage them to take some of those risks and the, and the learners to take some risks as well? Um. That is definitely a big consideration. I mean, as an instructional coach, I had to be willing to model everything. So when we were going online, all professional development was going to be online. We were going to do a combination of synchronous and asynchronous professional development. And we were going to talk about how that worked for them as the learner in that situation. Um, so I had to be a little bit vulnerable as a coach and ask for feedback. Um, but we really tried to model those things. And, you know, that encouragement was just 
for me as a coach, providing a lot of support and reinforcement that um, they could try something and take a thoughtful risk in their teaching practice and see how it went and they could always adjust. And it was a lot of those reminders, um, but we had to really find those small wins. So even when the technology wasn't doing what we wanted it to, or if students were participating like we hoped they would, we had to try and encourage teachers to see the things that were working and lean into that or to make those adjustments, but know that they could do that. And so I just tried to be very available and really try and be as proactive as, as, as possible in helping guide teachers through, um, through that so they could be resilient. Um, so that's how, how I would think of it, I guess. Um, but we have so many great teachers who also just worked together to share best practices as well. Um, Greg, I don't know if you wanna add some things from your, your end. Well, one thing I was thinking about was, you know, when, whenever you move into, uh, especially a remote environment, is ensuring that, you know, all students have access. Uh, that, that equity piece is huge. And so I know from a district perspective, there was a lot of thought and time put into how would we um, ensure that all kids had a hotspot and families had a hotspot and, and how do we make sure that kids have the appropriate technology and what happens if their technology isn't working? How do we provide those supports? Because that plays into, um, you know, uh, our, 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 our practitioners, our educators being able to dive in to taking the risks and taking the challenges to be able to, to extend that out to students, even when they have potentially some of those barriers. And so from a district standpoint, working hard to overcome those barriers. Um, but I also know just from an administrative end, you know, I, I, I encourage teachers to take a risk, you know, and, and I think that's, that's important to, to realize. I don't know if there's any of our, our attendees who are administrators, but uh, educators have to have that space to take, take those risks and take those chances to try those new things um, and, and really see what is going to work for them and feel comfortable and to find the, find the, the easy wins right? The easy steps in before they can continue to grow and grow. And, and we had those, those staffs who, who were, were, you know, hesitant at first, but now if we come in and say, Hey, we're going to turn off the chat for Microsoft teams. They're like, Whoa, wait a minute. No, no, can't do that. I need that right now. That's how I communicate with kids. That's we'll, right. We want to see that. So yeah, it's, uh, um, it's huge. Greg, thank you for providing such a natural segue into the next question we're going to address. I would also encourage panelists as you're, um, as during the, during the moments when you're not talking, I did skip over our question about what have been some of the biggest maker learning successes. All of you have shared some of those in some way, shape or form through your initial responses. But if you'd like to contribute the additional ones to the chat while folks are answering the equity question, that would be incredible. Um, but let's, let's stay on this, on this, uh, line of thought and line of questioning right here. So Greg mentioned it, things like internet and device access as an equity issue. I'd love to hear what are some of the other equity issues that you and your learners encountered and how you address them. And I'm particularly interested in the ones that really caught you by surprise. I think that we, we all know like working in education, knowing that there's robust access to technology for those who are privileged enough to have it, but we also know that there are issues of access for those who maybe don't. So my question for you is, what are, what are some of the equity issues that, that maybe caught you by surprise uh, and, and ways that you maybe addressed them uh, throughout the course of the year as you were trying to do maker learning? I'd like to jump in if that's okay. Um, I yeah, know. I was gonna say it was a tie between yeah. you, you <laughs> unmuting and Dean raising his hand, but tie goes to the runner. Your mute was already undone. So you're up. Like I want to take you back earlier mentioning on the assumptions that I was making of what students had available in their homes. And so we put together in our school communities and the, some of the classes that I work with uh, mystery STEM kits. And so these again were delivered to the students homes and in partnership with the families and a very flexible schedule uh, for students to engage in their learning with the teachers who were providing this learning opportunity students were able to use equipment uh, and these materials to build things like saws and jinx wood and miter boxes to build wooden structures a uh, hand sewing wearable tech like that was super cool light up led wearable tech and even just making paper circuits with 
copper tape and LEDs, materials that some of us have available in our school, we had to kind of package it and streamline it so that we can make it available to the students in their home. So they could take their ideas or their designs from ideation into creation. And really this couldn't happen without, you know, partnerships with educators uh, in, in both in-person and virtual learning environments to make this happen. And I can't emphasize enough the power of building and maintaining those connections uh, with fellow education workers, because really we are, as you can see now, our greatest resource. And the outpouring of kindness of educators who've been sharing resources and building relationships and making those connections with other virtual classrooms has been absolutely awesome. But I do want to highlight one of the struggles that I, you know, that keeps coming up. This is not new and it's part of our, you know, our system structures that we have in place that need to be torn down and addressed. It's an opportunity to build student competence, not only in critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, and global citizenship, but also enriching their learning skills and looking at social emotional learning while at home, creating these maker learning or experiential learning experiences. But this doesn't happen alone, and it can't happen without discussions and designing lessons where we look at culturally relevant and responsive practices. And that happens in establishing high expectations for all our learners. All our learners, including our racialized, LGBTQ, our marginalized students, and ensuring that the resources are available to them, either hard copy, print, or virtual library access through the school district or local public libraries using their virtual resources, but also taking into consideration who we're inviting into our classrooms as virtual speakers or mentors and how they're supporting students diving deeper into inquiry and project-based learning and really thinking about how the students see themselves represented because really representation matters. But that also goes to highlight, again, each of us has our own makeup of a class community of learners or what tools are being available to our students for accessibility supports. And so I just wanna give a shout out to Minecraft Education Edition and Flipgrid and their immersive reader. Oh my goodness. The built-in features of the immersive reader just really allow my students to feel that sense of independence, especially my English language learners who could both have the text, audio text of uh, a passage or something that I've shared with them in their own spoken language. And then again, in English so that they could build this independence and make those connections between the language learning. So just really wanted to put that out there, like really appreciate that the tools are there, they're available. We just need to get together and make the best use of them. That's amazing. That, that immersive reader is one of my favorite features of, of any, any technology anywhere. So thank you. Thank you for that. We'll go Dean and then Maddie. Oh, that was great. I, and I really, that was a really powerful statement. Thanks, Julia. Um, I'll just from a little bit of a different uh, spin on it too. Uh, some of the equity issues actually was from teachers. Like uh, there's a wide range of comfort levels and stuff too. So kids were getting some robust experiences in other class and other classes. Some people were just kind of still uh, pushing across uh, work packages and say, hey, here you go, good luck to you. So that was something that I think uh, even the crisis learning we had this time last year allowed more teachers to take risks and start to get comfortable uh, you know, with it in that too. But we're still working on a mass, uh, you know, of getting a critical mass of teachers that are, are comfortable using uh, technology to give the students uh, that, that accessibility at home and, and, and a kind of a, the same message, so to speak. Uh, we're lucky in my school division, we have a Connected Educator program. So we have a lot of uh, teachers that are, you know, we get a, our own class set of laptops which we help bridge the digital divide with by actually giving them to students that needed them. And that's so that worked it. And that's so we're giving out our HP streams all over. Cause uh, this, uh, the city that I live in and the school that I am at, um, we have like a wide variety of uh, diversity of students from uh, some people that live in our core area to uh, affluent areas. Uh, so the socioeconomic is that we have uh, different learners. We have a, a high Filipino, uh, um, uh, population and we have a, a high First Nations or Indigenous uh, population too. So we got a little bit of everything going on and it's great. The diversity is our, our strength for sure. So, you know, working together with that and being able to provide, you know, opportunities for kids to learn at home and even uh, getting out Wi-Fi sticks if they didn't have Wi-Fi, you know, and that type of a thing um, was, is, is really important too. So making sure that they had the equipment and they had, uh, 
you know, teachers that knew how to use the equipment so then the kids could just, you know, learn and, and do that. But you also have to take in consideration too, sometimes maybe they only have one con uh, computer at home and there's a, a whole, you know, they have three or four, you know, uh, brothers or siblings, you know, sisters and that type of a thing. And uh, you can't expect them to be uh, synchronous. You got to allow for asynchronous learning as well. So, you know, even taping the lessons or, you know, give them different times to do their projects and that type of thing. That's where I think the makerspace came in uh, handy because, you know, they could take, you know, shots of their, uh, you know, even with their phone, they could hand things in and say, hey, am I doing this right? And they could do it at different times uh, too when they had access to their, their computers or, and their technology and that type of thing. Um, yeah, I just uh, think giving students choice, uh, you know, is really important too. So, uh, like I said, I think there's a lot of silver linings going uh, forward with this. And I think that definitely uh, for students to have uh, technology and Wi-Fi at home, uh, it's definitely becoming a human right, not just a, a need. And I'm hoping that that's one thing moving forward that will hopefully bridge that digital divide and, and more students will have access. Every student should have access to the same learning materials as anybody else. So I'm hoping that's, I'm hoping that's one of the, the things that move forward. Absolutely. Yep. And that's, you're, you're getting to our last question. So I'm going to maybe come back to you for that in just a minute. But uh, one thing before I turn it over to Maddie, I think one of the things that I didn't even really consider, and it's such an important point, and I'm so glad that you raised it, Dean, is this equity issue of the the skill set of the educators, right? Like you mentioned, like if educators aren't well positioned to move to virtual learning and then on top of that, be able to offer these hands-on learning experiences, the learners that they have aren't getting the same opportunity as somebody, as, as a learner in another classroom. So the professional learning, all of those things that go along with that absolutely is an equity issue that can, that can, impact many, many, many of our learners. So thank you for that. And now Maddie, I'd love to hear what you have. Sure, it's really adding on to what everybody else Great. said. I think it varies from material access to digital access, um, to access to time and like other adults. I know, I think Robert had mentioned in the chat, parents and guardians at home. Um, I remember asking students at one point just to color code a math lesson as we were going through looking for numbers and they needed three different colors and I had multiple students who could not find three different colored writing utensils in their house. So we had to switch to like different shapes and we circled and boxed and starred. Um, and I think it's just being flexible and thinking of alternatives when you can. I also had the opportunity to host a virtual drone camp this summer um, outside of school where we were putting together boxes and sending out everything students needed to build them. Um, and I was working with the professor who was putting it together, really just thinking about what do students need um, to actually do this. And he was making assumptions like students had wire clippers at home um, and very specific, specific things that a lot of students just aren't going to have. And we had to have conversations about what can students use instead. It may not be ideal, not what we would use if we were in person, but given the situation we're in, what can students use um, in order for the majority of students to be able to participate fully? Um, and then the access to time, I had assumed a lot of students would be able to join at least for a few minutes of class um, without their attention divided, but I would often have students holding younger siblings, their parents were at work and guardians were at work. So I had toddlers on the screen at all times. I remember this was back last spring. At one point a student had asked me, oh, can you watch my sibling? And they put a baby in front of the camera and went to the bathroom. Um, and it, students have had other obligations that nobody really foresaw because they didn't think that they needed to. And they have impacted students' abilities to learn and engage in class and just being I guess, attentive to that and also just having grace and compassion for students and where they're at and what their home life uh, might look like during the pandemic. Um, even the assumption that students are working from a home um, has not been true for some of my students the majority of the time. Um, and access to parents and guardians if they have questions, if they need something, if they can't figure out a computer problem um, often hasn't been the case. So I think that there's been a lot of equity issues, not necessarily caused by the pandemic, but highlighted by the pandemic, um, that hopefully with some more attention and light sh shown on them, maybe we'll get some more attention and work to fix them and better them in the future. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think that 
I think that one of the most important takeaways there, well, I don't know why my camera just froze, sorry. I think one of the most important takeaways there is, is how you ended that statement in that many of these equity issues are things that the sole classroom educator, the sole administrator, sole instructional coach can't solve on their own. A lot of these are systemic issues that have existed for a very long time and have been amplified by many things that have happened over the last year and a half and, and even, even longer than that. So yes, the hope is that, that there's light being shown on that and that we can continue to address the equity issues that are impairing the ability for our learners to learn in an optimal environment for each of them. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question. It was answered in the Q&A by Dean. Uh, I would encourage, or no, it was Drew. Dean is typing. Drew got to the question first though. So Dean is still working. We're having a little typing war here. That's okay. Um, panelists, please feel free to answer that question. Maddie, you touched on it a little bit already. Uh, the question was, how do you involve the community and families with maker learning? I loved hearing about the professor that you worked alongside with, with for the drone camp, doing things out in the community, like the drone camp. Like those are incredible things. I would encourage our panelists to answer via via typing or text in the question and answer. Uh, and we are we are rapidly approaching, actually right now, our last question. Um, so I'm going to encourage each of our panelists to do their quick 30 second, I almost said 30 minute, their quick 30 second pitch for as we continue to chart our way forward, are there aspects of this time in education you or your learners want to carry into the future? Again, this is specifically related to maker learning, but you can also talk more broadly than that. But thinking through the lens of maker learning the things that you've been able to accomplish, the things that have worked well for you and for your learners, what are the things that you would like to carry forward? If you had one major thing. I'll just want to highlight that uh, just based on my experiences with class communities and the privilege of, of all these amazing education workers and families and students they get to work alongside, that relationships remain key. Providing everything and scaffolding on their learning and giving them the tools to amplify their voice and connect their ideas and share their experiences are all a part of that, but they, they all want to feel connected and they really appreciate those relationships. So if anything between the flip flopping and the virtual and the remote and in person learning relationships. Thank you. They're the key to everything right. You know, Nick, one thing I was uh, thinking as Zaley was talking is the, the importance of creativity. You know, uh, I think educators are one of the, the most creative forces in the world. And, and being able to dive into that creative energy in order to meet those needs, in order to bring in community members, in order to bring in families, um, in order to to meet those needs, I, I think it's important. And so I think keeping 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 the idea of how to be creative as we move forward is, is going to be something that will continue to be powerful in how we provide uh, that voice and choice in education. Excellent. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, I would echo a lot of that um, from both Zelia and Greg is that education as a whole doesn't exist in isolation. It exists in a community with our students and families. It exists in the political climate we're in. It exists um, in the pandemic this year. Um, and keeping in mind that what we're teaching students and what we hope students gain from maker learning is the ability to use it on their own in the future and be able to put things together and big ideas and build things um, and create what they wanna create. Um, so just keeping in mind that we're not teaching kids just to teach, but we're teaching them to use those ideas and what they know to impact their community around them. I love it. Thank you. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, um, I would just say, yeah, of course, relationships is, is the key to everything, but also allowing for more flexibility and choice in, uh, in the way we assess. Uh, definitely get, we kind of have standardized testing up here in, in Canada too, a little bit. I'm not sure if we do the same way uh, you guys do in the States. But uh, I we really have a little think, bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit from what I've been gleaning uh, over and stuff too. But sometimes less is more. And having kids uh, instead of trying to cover the curriculum and make sure that you have 
you know, checked all your boxes or whatever. You should know what the curriculum is and know what the outcomes are. Then design these maker opportunities that will meet all those and more. And you'll find that you'll get stuff out of the kids you never even thought before. Like I had a one student, he maybe wasn't the most academically in what people think, right? Uh, doing the best. But I gave him a maker project in, in Minecraft and he goes, oh, it's my turn to shine. And you just never get to, you get to unearth a lot of things by giving kids the flexibility and the choice to, to learn. You're still the teacher. You still have to have structure and you still have to have expectations in that. But a lot of times you just have to provide some of that, but then let them go. And, and when they ask you, can I do this? Say yes. You know, like, yeah, that's a good idea. What are you, what are you thinking here? And those are the thinking skills I think Maddie was uh, talking about too, that that's what they're gonna need in the future. They don't have to mimic and memorize a formula or whatever. How do you use it? How do you come up with new ideas? How do you solve wicked problems? That's what we need. We need to get out of the industrial revolution thinking a little bit, but I'll get off my soapbox now. But uh, yeah, I know this is, is pretty cool. Drew, anything to add or? Wow, there's been so many I know, great takeaways. I know. <laughs> I'm like, whoop, check, check, check. Those are all mentioned, yep, but they're all so important. This is when it's tough to be last. <laughs> they're so important. I mean, I will second everything everyone has said. I mean, I'll also just add a, a focus on student agency is really key. We want to help our students to gain skills to participate, engage, and become empowered as learners. And we really have an opportunity to continue utilizing a lot of the blended learning strategies that we've tried, maybe for the first time ever, um, for people who who are new to it or people who have experience, but to keep using those techniques and leveraging our technology in powerful ways. Um, the pandemic has really brought to light um, the, access, the access that students need to things like internet and devices. And fortunately, we've been able to provide those things. Um, so we just need to continue using those to have learning be accessible at all times, places and spaces that work for learning because learning doesn't just um, shut off at the end of the school day. <laughs> I just, before, before we move to wrap up, I just, there's a virtual round of applause that needs to happen here for the educators that we have on this panel today and thanking them so much for the things that they've been able to share, the questions that they've been able to trigger in my mind for things that I'm thinking through, how we can better support educators who are looking to continue offering these opportunities to make it home because we know that there's value in that. We know it's powerful and why should it be limited to the schoolhouse or to the after school program? So thank you to each and every one of you for taking time out of your already incredibly busy schedules to share your brilliance and your hard work with educators who are here with us tonight and who will view this recording later. Um, and thank you also for hopping in and answering those questions uh, in, the, in the chat, in the Q&A as well. Um, I, we did have an activity for tonight, but it seemed wrong to cut off this brilliance. So we will be sharing that activity with folks after the fact. We will be sharing that out with our follow-up email. So please be on the lookout for that. It's called Scamper. It's an activity to think about different aspects of your project planning and your design process and figure out how you can modify it for any challenges that you might encounter. I'm gonna skip that. That's not supposed to zoom. So just a couple resources that I wanted to go over with all of you. These are things that will also be in the follow-up email. Digital Promise has an entire section of the website dedicated to maker learning and resources that are beneficial for your practice around that. We have a maker learning leadership framework, which can help guide the creation of maker learning programs in your schools or your after school programs or informal education programs. We have a filmmaker challenge guide that's not necessarily designed for maker learning at home, but is a really wonderful way to think through how film is actually our maker modality. And then we also have our learning studios project library, projects that were meant for the learning studio, but can also be easily adapted to considerations for learning at home. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Microsoft Make Code and the incredible things that they offer on their website. 
being able to work with actual emulators of hardware like Adafruit's technology, Hummingbird technology, those amazing tools are on my, uh, Microsoft Make Code as well as coding with Minecraft right in the web, which is really cool. And then last but not least, one of our other partner organizations, MakerEd, has an entire section of their website dedicated to remote education and learning in the making. They've been doing a lot of wonderful online tutorials for things that can be made at home that I think would be incredible for the educators out there and for your learners as well. And again, those will be sent following this with an email. And last but not least, this Saturday, April 10th, 2021, from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we are hosting EdCamp Maker Learning, which is a unconference style professional learning experience where you get to build the session board that day, talk about the things that are of interest to you, and not have to sit and listen to one presenter sharing just their ideas. You get at least five people like we've had tonight. So that's a really exciting opportunity. That is a free virtual event that anyone can attend, and we'd love to see you there. Great. And we just want to thank everyone again for attending, um, particularly all the educators who joined today and shared all of their ideas about how to create more equitable learning experiences for their students at this time of crisis learning and when things are um, very tumultuous. Um, as Nick said, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share with us. Thanks so much to our attendees who are um, really active and asking questions and sharing their ideas in the chat as well. It's always great to um, get to collaborate with folks. Um, if you uh, like the content that our HP Teaching Fellows and our HP Spotlight School folks shared today, um, you can find more of that by using the hashtag reinvent the classroom on Twitter. We host a Twitter chat on the third Wednesday of each month. So that uh, this month, that'll be April 21st, and that is at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So we hope to continue to collaborate with you there. Um, thanks so much to everyone, and we hope that you have a lovely evening. Thanks, everybody.